The Faculty of Arts is honoured to welcome Professor Gillian Triggs, President of the Australian Human Rights Commission, as the speaker at the annual public lecture of the Macquarie University Research Centre for Agency, Values and Ethics, or in short, CAVE. CAVE is one of two university research centres based in the Faculty of Arts. Established in 2011, CAVE fosters interdisciplinary theoretical research on human agency and the self, moral cognition, the foundations of moral and legal norms, and moral and legal responsibility. It also aims to address practical issues at the intersection of ethics, law, medicine, and cognitive science. The center has a strong reputation for research excellence. Much of the research in CAVE is funded by the Australian Research Council, and the center hosts a number of ARC fellows, including the Discovery Early Career Research Award and four future fellows, as well as a Templeton Fellow. CAVE has a strong commitment to mentoring junior researchers, including postgraduate candidates and postdoctoral fellows, through supervision and the opportunity to host events such as conferences and workshops. The Centre has a lively programme of events throughout the year. It hosts prominent visitors, as you see tonight, international and domestic, here at Macquarie University, and Centre members are actively engaged with the media and the broader community. The centre has five primary research clusters, with much cross-fertilisation between these clusters, giving rise to dynamic and exciting research. The clusters are human agency and selfhood, moral cognition, neuroethics and neural law, applied ethics, bioethics and clinical ethics, mind, brain, evolution and culture, and last but not least, human rights and social justice. Tonight's lecture is being hosted under the auspices of the Cluster on Human Rights and Social Justice. It gives me therefore great pleasure to ask the leader of this cluster, Professor Denise Myerson from the Macquarie Law School, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Julian Triggs. Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Executive Dean of Medicine and Health Sciences, Executive Dean of Science and Engineering, distinguished guests, members of the academic community. It is a great honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Triggs, to present the annual public lecture hosted by the Macquarie University Research Center for Agency Values and Ethics. Professor Triggs is president of the Australian Human Rights Commission and Professor Emeritus at the University of Sydney. She holds a PhD from the University of Melbourne and a Doctor of Laws honoris causa from Macquarie University in recognition of her lifelong contribution to the protection of human rights. Other positions Professor Triggs has held include Dean of the Faculty of Law and Chalice Professor of International Law at the University of Sydney. And prior to that, Director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. She is also a former barrister and a governor of the College of Law. Professor Triggs has had an illustrious academic career and has written extensively in the area of international law. She has combined this with international commercial legal practice in the course of which she has advised governments and international organizations on international disputes. At the Human Rights Commission, she focuses on implementing the human rights treaties that Australia has ratified and working on practical approaches to human rights matters with countries in the Asia-Pacific region. She will speak to us tonight about business and human rights, which is an issue of increasing interest in the globalized world of today, in which business activities have the potential to affect human rights both positively and negatively. <coughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Triggs. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. Um, and can I also uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to recognise the many uh, executive deeds and the very interdisciplinary audience that we have uh, through this research institute. Um, of course, it's always a great pleasure to come back to a university that's given you an honorary doctorate. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> and uh, I always feel at home here, or I do. I think it's a wonderful university, and this building, I think, bespeaks the 
the modern approach to <coughs> education and particularly the interdisciplinarity um, of the of the uh, of the work that you do here at the university. Um, I'll, t I'll turn this on so you can hear me a little better. Um, I was, of course, very pleased to be invited to come to a research body that is concerned with values and ethics, um, because, of course, it's values and ethics that underlie the human rights uh, that are critical to the achievement of rights in practice. The Australian Human Rights Commission has a mandate, as you will know, a statutory mandate, to hold the government and the private <coughs> sector to account for compliance with international human rights treaties, to which Australia is a party. We are in the business of the law at the Human Rights Commission of rights and legal obligations. But we know, and I've learnt deeply in the last three years, uh, that laws are successful only when they command the respect of the general community. There must be some form of normative culture that respects uh, human rights, that expects social justice, and that rights will be protected. And this is where, of course, the societal values and ethics come into play. That's rather abstract, but let me give you some examples of what I mean, at least, of the interplay of law and politics. Some of you will be aware that a couple of weeks ago, a superannuation investor, Hester, was a health fund manager, withdrew its 3.5% investment in Transfield Services, which provides uh, the guards and various um, facilities for the <coughs> Uh, detention centres through Wilson Security in part to the centres in Nauru and uh, Manus Island and in the Australian detention centres that continue to operate. The risk of litigation arising from the Senate inquiry uh, confirming reports of the health impact of prolonged mandatory detention of asylum seekers and the many allegations of sexual and physical assault of course affect the share price. Now, as you may be aware, also, the Australian Human Rights Commission produced a report, The Forgotten Children, uh, given to the attorney last November, tabled in Parliament in February this year, uh, and it was rejected by the government uh, out of hand. Indeed, uh, the senior members of government decided that they were too busy to even read it. Well, the government then held its own inquiry into the allegations of sexual abuse in um, uh, Nauru, and in that Moss inquiry, which confirmed and uh, uh, increased, of course, the evidence that we'd addressed in our own report. And that, that has now been confirmed in the Senate inquiry, uh, which has recently uh, confirmed exactly the same statistical evidence of the impact uh, of uh, prolonged detention and of the allegations of sexual and other physical assaults. Now, the key point here is that these uh, inquiries have had almost no impact on government behaviour and, and government policy. But what has had an impact is that the investors in the companies that are earning the billions of dollars to make these services are now starting to say there are serious risks of litigation. And when you realise the extent of the possible litigation claims that could be brought against transfer services, uh, then you realise why the investors see that it's necessary for them to withdraw their superannuation funds. Um, from a technical legal point of view, as you'll all know, uh, the obligations of directors of companies is to get the best possible shareholding price for those that own the shares. That's what companies do. But what is increasingly happening is that the director's duties, the fiduciary duties to the shareholders, is now being viewed in terms of wider social values, translated into technical terms of vulnerability to, to litigation. This is not a sentimental view about wanting to support human rights necessarily, although some companies certainly do. But the key point is that they now see meeting societal perceptions, and meeting the values of modern society, is a very important part of the success of the company and ultimately the shareholding itself. So here we have the uh, Transfield, a massive billion dollar, many billion dollar company operating in Australia, has now separated itself from Transfield Services and has now got to, uh, under the agreement, must rebrand itself within a year. Uh, and in the meantime, it's lost a significant percentage of its uh, superannuation funds. Well, I shouldn't say significant, 3.5 is not huge. But others, such as First State Super, 
and Christian Super have also either sold their shares in Transworld Services or they've blacklisted the company. Um, but some idea of the power of such decisions as have been made by Hester is that Hester is an, a part of an international group with a total of $59 trillion to manage every year. Staggering amounts of money. So when they start to make these judgments, then we start to see an impact on behaviour and, I would hope, eventually on government policy. Well, a second example um, concerns the behaviour of Uber, uh, the revolutionary taxi service. Although I don't know, they call themselves a taxi service. The business model for Uber is to charge the market rate for their taxi services. So they don't put on a meter. They simply have a market rate that varies with demand. It's a, it's a classic um, a free market uh, business model. If there's a high demand for their services, the price goes up. And when the demand is lower, the price goes down. And, and most of us wouldn't have much objection to that. But, as some of you may know also, those who tried to get out of Sydney, the centre of Sydney, during the Martin Place siege, found that the taxi fares with Uber had gone up fourfold on the normal fare. What is extremely interesting is that within half an hour or so of it becoming known through social media that the fare had quadrupled to get out of the centre of the Sydney, uh, the Sydney district, and Uber became aware of this social media um, immediate access to this information, Uber Im moved very quickly and they declared that all those using Uber services to get out of the city on that day would be free. Now, that is an example, of course, of the power of social media, but also an example of a modern company that was prepared to see that they clearly made a mistake. Or, interestingly, that the market forces need to be moderated in certain circumstances. And this, of course, was one of them. Um, a third example concerns the sponsors for the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. Um, those sponsors have been subject to transient criticism for their association with alleged human rights violations suffered by migrant labour used in the construction of sporting facilities. Now, I've seen this with my own eyes. I've been to Qatar a couple of times, and it is absolutely shocking the way in which the construction workers are um, uh, dealt with. Uh, uh, the maids in the hotels have had their passports taken away. Uh, their, uh, their salaries that they think they earn are significantly reduced because of the, the money that the service companies and agencies take away, uh, one for finding the, the job, two for getting passports and visas, and three for housing, accommodation and, and living uh, food, living expenses and uniforms. So at the end of a, a six-month or a one-year contract, they find they've got very little at the end of the day. Well, these sorts of concerns, I think, are now well known in the, in the media, and social media campaigners also influence sponsors to take action promoting better labour conditions in Qatar. Um, remarkably, a couple of months ago in July, uh, FIFA, given its own internal uh, problems, agreed to recognise the United Nations <coughs> guiding principles on business and human rights and said it would make it compulsory for all contractual partners and all those within the supply chain to comply with those principles. Well, the Transfield Services, Uber and FIFA cases are but three of thousands of examples globally where businesses are seeking advice from their directors, their legal advisors, stakeholders, shareholders and the general community on the human rights risks and strategies to protect against reputational damage uh, but of course, ultimately, loss of shareholder value. More proactively, would the corporate scandals involving, for example, the Australian Wheat Board or Enron have occurred if their managers had been more alert to the human rights risks and spoken up to their CEOs and directors? Today, new ways of working with business and for business are evolving to protect human rights with multiple touch points on law and ethics. Increasingly, Directors, shareholders and consumers and the community are asked to reflect on questions that include considerations beyond the black letter law. Questions like, just because an act is illegal, should it be allowed in the company? How is the public interest best served by the company's behaviour? What are the reputational risks to the company if it insists on its technical legal rights but ignores its ethical and societal values? Rather more cynically, how will the behaviour of the company look 
on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald or the Age or the Australian. Well, I've had many uh, in, in my, my earlier life as a practicing lawyer, many examples of the, the conflict uh, of, and they were conflicts, of law and ethics. One, um, uh, it was kindly mentioned that I directed the British Institute for International Law. Uh, just before I arrived, that institute had received um, over a million dollars a year for five years from a major cigarette company. Well, it was a real quandary for me because we needed money for the research institute, um, but uh, I wasn't at all happy about taking it from a cigarette company that in the normal course of events wasn't remotely interested in international law or any of the things that we were working for. Uh, and we had to find some way of uh, getting out of that contract and, uh, and finding funding from other uh, phil philanthropic sources. And indeed, that is something that we are increasingly remarking on at the moment, that as governments withdraw funds from human rights-related work, the private sector, but particularly philanthropists, are starting to see the opportunity to fill the gap. And I think we're, go we're going to be facing that uh, to a higher degree as the years move on. But another matter that I worked on that I thought uh, it, it taught me a few lessons was uh, I was asked to advise the board of directors for a company that imports uh, phosphate from the Western Sahara. Now you may know that the Western Sahara is not a state. It was a colonial territory of Spain and Spain when it had its internal uh, political troubles withdrew and said have a plebiscite and decide what you want to do. Well, they had a plebiscite, and the plebiscite was to be independent, and the United Nations supported that uh, independence movement in the early 80s. But neither Morocco nor Mauritania uh, agreed with that outcome, and Morocco engaged on what became termed the Green March. They marched into Western Sahara, and we've had then a civil war on and off ever since, with the Polisario <coughs> fighting for the independence of Western Sahara. Now, that's all a lot of, a lot of background. But what happened was that this company was successfully mining phosphate, uh, important for fertilisers, um, and I was asked to brief them on the legal aspects of gaining revenue from the mines in uh, Western Sahara in a context in which they were not feeding the money back to an authorised representative of the state. And they knew that, of course, in ev any other state they would be bound to pay royalties and to respect in various ways the rights of the peoples living in those mining towns. So I talked to them a little bit about this very un unsecure or insecure sta uh, status, uh, legal status of Western Sahara and about uh, what the normal responsibilities of a mining company would be. And then it just occurred to me to look around the table of the direct directors of this company to say, has any one of you ever been to Western Sahara to your mining sites? And not one director had ever been there. And for the, I said, for $10,000, you could get yourself at least a business class airfare and go and visit the mining companies. And you might then see whether they need schools, what the community needs, uh, how, what their working conditions are. And you would thereby be able to engage in some kind of um, proactive human rights-based uh, policy with the local community and hopefully avoid reputational risk. Uh, given that you are uh, gaining revenues of a significant level from this mining operation, uh, from, of course, a non-renewable natural resource of a country uh, or area like Western Sahara. Um, another example would be the Asian Development Bank. Bank. You would think an impeccable body to be working for development in the region, but with money in part from Australia, they went into an infrastructure project in Cambodia to build a railway line, uh, but five years later, it turned out that they'd been pushing people off their land without compensation, and all of this has come back to bite them. Had they thought a little bit earlier about visiting the site, understanding the community in which they were operating, uh, they would not have lost hundreds of millions of dollars in a railway project that now almost certainly can't go ahead. And there are responsibilities. Other issues that you might recall, the Kakadu National Park and the Ranger uranium mines, uh, all going ahead on the basis of a failure to consult the indigenous community and that uh, because of, um, of uh, public protest, social media didn't exist uh, then in, the, in the, the late 80s and early 90s, but marches from Sydney and Melbourne um, up to uh, the uh, Kakadu National Park uh, uh, were very effective politically in preventing uh, Australian energy resources from going ahead with the Ranger uranium mine and uh, having an impact on the UNESCO 
um, uh, status of Kakadu National Park. And another final example that, um, that, 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 that I was in, involved in at one stage was the, um, the BHP um, mining for gold in uh, Octedi, what was known as Octedi in Papua New Guinea, that uh, led to the uh, tailings uh, dams uh, splitting in the, in the uh, very, very severe weather conditions there and polluting the Fly River for generations, uh, preventing local landowners and fishers to, uh, uh, to fish in that river and to live the life with their children and families as they have done in the past, all of which led to um, uh, a, at least two decades of litigation and very significant financial costs, all of which problems could have been resolved had there been a much closer understanding of the human rights foundations uh, or implications of the actions of these companies. Well, you might say, what's the Australian Human Rights Commission contributing to this discussion? What can we do uh, and why do we think we've got a role to play? Well, I'd suggest that we do have, in fact, a, a unique position to understand the relationship between the corporate world, the business world and human rights. Because we know from our investigation and conciliation service that we offer to the public that the overwhelming number of human rights and, and uh, discrimination cases that arise in the public arena arise in the context of employment and to a lesser extent the delivery of goods and services in the private sector. In addition to our investigation and conciliation service, we also work with business to develop resources to assist employers to comply with specific discrimination legislation. Uh, for example, we've just finished a major project on the incidence of pregnancy or discrimination against women on the grounds of pregnancy in the workforce. Now, I'm a child of the 60s at the university in the early 60s. Um, uh, Germaine Greer was uh, about three years ahead of me at the University of Melbourne. Uh, uh, and of course, a feminist uh, I was of, of, of uh, following very much in her footsteps, it never occurred to me that what I thought was fixed in the 60s should be such a profound problem as it now t uh, appears to be in Australia. Uh, the evidence that my uh, colleague, one of the commissioners of the commission, Liz Broderick, has adduced on, on pregnancy discrimination in the workforce is absolutely shocking. Um, a, a young girl, 12 weeks pregnant, can say to her co-worker in confidence that, uh, that she's pregnant um, and strangely the office work is reorganised and she finds that she no longer has a job or that she's only offered possi the possibility of casual work with a few hours when she returns. And this is now endemic, uh, it's or throughout the community and very little understanding of what the legal, the legal rights are even under our own Australian legislation, the Sex Discrimination Act. Well, I've mentioned then our Investigation and Conciliation Service. Um, last year, we received about 22,000 inquiries and complaints. Now, that's about a third of the work of the Commission. It takes about 40 people uh, uh, to do this kind of response. Critically, um, you cannot go to the federal court to complain about human rights breaches or about breaches of the sex discrimination legislation or legislation on disability discrimination, age discrimination or race discrimination, you cannot go to the courts first without coming to us at the Commission. So that is why we, we receive such a huge body of complaints from the general public. Um, I, I know that one of the primary concerns of, of CAVE uh, is um, uh, obviously ethics and values and social justice and I'd suggest that by bringing in 21, 22,000 inquiries and complaints a year and handling them across the year is probably one of the best means of access to justice for ordinary Australians that that exists. Uh, it costs nothing to, com uh, to make a complaint, it costs nothing if you're a respondent, and we conciliate about 72% of the cases. Um, some we don't conciliate, a very tiny number, about 2 to 3% might go to the um, federal court, uh, and over the last 20 years, we have never been overruled uh, on a matter of law in the federal court. And when I report on a human rights matter to Parliament, as I'm bound to do, the government has never challenged the findings of the president or recommendations. They will challenge them in the media and say they're wrong, biased, bizarre, I think our former Prime Minister said on one occasion, not very long ago, but never 
despite the fact that they have the right to do it statutorily, never have they ever dared to challenge what the Commission has done in the courts because they know very well that we have the law basically right. Now, like any other body, we can make mistakes about the law, and I'm more than happy for that to be challenged and for the law to be clarified. Uh, but it has never happened, um, in fact. But it also underscores the fact that most Australians cannot take these kinds of matters to the courts. It's too expensive and, uh, and too um, uh, disturbing, really, to get involved in adversarial litigation when they can actually resolve most matters uh, through the conciliation process. So if you come to our offices on the, on the uh, third floor of Pitt Street, you'll see it's a rabbit warren of tiny rooms with barely enough space for two or three people. Uh, but that face-to-face -face contact means that in the end, reasonable, fair-minded people will find a solution. And we find very, very often that the manager of the company uh, will come in and say they had no idea that the personnel manager had reorganised the office on the basis of pregnancy or that a man who was entitled to, um, in the normal course of events, to promotion did not get that promotion because he was over 55 uh, or that there was no access uh, to the employment offices um, because there were no ramps for those with a disability. Uh, so they, they, the managers will typically come into our offices, uh, see what complaint is being made against their company, uh, and they will say, well, that's not acceptable, it's all confidential. They go back to their offices and they can typically achieve quite a powerful systemic change at a very quiet level. So you don't get explosions in the media, uh, their reputation is not tarnished in the media, and, um, and, and you, we can achieve something like systemic change within that organisation. So um, we, we are um, uh, very proud of the work that we do, um, but perhaps it's not as well known to Australians as it should be, but I do believe it is one of the most accessible forms of access to real justice uh, that, that we can achieve, given how expensive the federal court has become with the, with the fees that have recently been imposed. But my key point in discussing the, the role of the Commission is that about, uh, about two-thirds, 70% of complaints arise in the business context. So that 80% of complaints under the Sex Discrimination Act are in the context of employment. 62% under the Age Discrimination Act are in employment. 40% under the Race Discrimination uh, Act are employment. And 35% um, under the Disability um, uh, uh, discrimination Act. So, in that, or for that reason, we, I think, can, can genuinely say that for most Australians, most of the time, their rights, their, their human rights, but particularly rights not to be discriminated against, arise in the, in the business environment. So, in, 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 it's a harsh thing to say, but we believe that to a significant degree, business is both the cause of violations of many fundamental rights, but it's also the solution. So one of the priorities for the Human Rights Commission now is to work more closely with business to um, ensure that they're better trained and better understand what rights are and ensure that they've adopted them systemically. It's far better for us to be dealing at the front end of the problem rather than at the complaint end. Obviously, we must handle the complaints, but we'd much rather work with them right at the beginning to say, well, how can, how can we help you understand the new amendments to the Race Discrimination Act on sexual orientation? Uh, how can we help you uh, to understand how you can have a more diverse workforce, uh, which will um, give a greater originality, a greater dynamism, a much greater, a better work uh, environment for your company if you were to comply with basic human rights? But let me perhaps um, give you one example of, of, how, of how this works. Um, the, I've mentioned that there have been very recent amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act uh, dealing with sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex. That came into force a couple of years ago. Most uh, companies are not really aware of this law at all. Uh, but we had uh, one complainant who, uh, and this is a, a true story, uh, claimed that the director of the company for whom she had worked sent a letter to the company's creditors saying that the negative financial position of the company was directly related to the fact that the complainant had changed her, her gender identity from male to female, and this was the cause of the company's decline. 
The complainant said that the letter outed her as transgender to many in the industry and she resigned from the company. The company um, did resolve the agreement. Uh, they apologised and very often, interestingly, the complainant is not looking for a financial settlement. Then It's not like the David Jones harassment case that we did settle. I can only mention that one because they wanted it in the media. But uh, those are cases where the complainants are looking for big financial settlements and we get the big law firms involved, but it's quite unusual. Mostly we're dealing with small companies where complainants are interested in an apology and in proper processes within their place of employment. They're not cynical or opportunistic attempts to, to gain money. What they want is a written apology, and that is what this particular complainant asked for. And the company directors had to write to their creditors, uh, emphasising that there's no connection whatsoever be between the complainant's transgender identity and the company's financial uh, position. But another example that, that occurred a little while, a while ago, and I, I think I can make it sufficiently neutral that you won't identify it, but a young man, uh, a gay young man, had, was, had been diagnosed as HIV positive. But uh, no matter which insurance company he applied to, he could not get insurance. He couldn't travel with insurance. He couldn't get medical insurance. He couldn't get uh, wage employment insurance or insurance for his house. And uh, eventually he came to us and we said, well, um, that is discriminatory. Uh, there is no clear connection between the insurance risk and HIV positive, necessarily, with modern treatment. Uh, and we asked the insurance company to come and talk to us at the Commission. They admitted that they were relying on out outdated by 30 years statistics in the United Kingdom and you'll be interested to know, and I didn't know this before we got involved in this case, that insurance companies actually don't have much actuarial information for Australians. They have it for Britain or Europe, and they base their policies and their pricing on, on this kind of dated information, um, which, which is astonishing. Uh, my colleague uh, Susan Ryan, who's the Age Disability Commissioner, has been working in this area as well, trying to find out why so many arcane policies are based on these outdated statistics. In any event, the, the, um, a senior manager of the company came in, explained this, acknowledged that it was dated material, um, met the young man concerned, and was very impressed with him, and said, well, we'll do something. So he went back to the actuarial experts. They commissioned some work uh, based on Australian medical uh, health circumstances for young people diagnosed HIV positive, and they crafted an insurance policy, more expensive, but they crafted an insurance policy for uh, people with his condition. Now, what happened, and we know the end of the bit of the end of the story because the manager maintained his connection with the commission, that because they established a, an insurance policy for this condition, word spread like wildfire, and gay or uh, 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 people of different sexual orientation then supported that insurance company not because they were HIV positive, but because they supported a company that was prepared to be open-minded and rethink their policies and created a whole new market for this company, which is now, I gather, doing quite well. So we can have... We can, <laughs> well, that's all right. But we can have, then, some rather sad stories coming into the, into the Commission. Um, but it is possible, in a very high percentage of those cases that get to the formal complaints level, to achieve a good outcome in a confidential way with the company and get the company to think in a more modern way about the way they're running their business and understanding that by having a narrow vision about who their employees are or who they market their goods and services to, you're actually cutting yourself off from a much wider market and a much more diverse, fruitful, innovative and creative workforce. Um, well. One point that I uh, uh, might make that, that underscores the Transfield example is the commercial power that some companies have. And this is not the, the level that I've just been talking about, but, but at the more transnational and international level. But you might be interested to know that many glo global corporations have revenues that rival the entire uh, gross domestic product of sovereign nations. Of the 100 largest economies in the world, 51 are transnational corporations. Only 49 of the largest economies in the world are nation states. The combined sales of the world's top 200 corporations are far greater than a quarter of the world's economic activity. 
and the top 200 corporations' combined sales are bigger than the combined economies of 182 countries. And when you realize uh, these statistics, you start to understand the dimension of the problem, but also the opportunity that presents itself. Because we do tend to think governments are going to solve these problems for us. And I know from experience they're not going to. <laughs> so why don't we look at working positively with these corporations? And another example, Microsoft revenue in 2010 amounted to 62 billion. Croatia's um, was uh, 60. General Electric's revenue uh, of 150 billion last year surpassed that of New Zealand's revenue at 140 billion. So it starts to put things in some sort of context. Where is the money and how can we work more creatively um, with these companies? For the international lawyers here tonight, you will know that international law is about state-to-state -state responsibility. It's the state that's responsible for breaches of human rights within its borders, within its territorial borders. But we also know that with the economy uh, wielding such power, we really needed to develop some capacity for responsibility for these enormous uh, companies. Um, and if I can digress just for a moment, you'll know that one of the very great developments from the Second World War and the Nuremberg Tribunal was the idea, as part of the dicta of the Nuremberg Tribunal, that it is men who commit war crimes, not abstract entities. The state is the abstract entity. Men commit war crimes, women too, of course. Now, that, as you know, those war crimes trials were held and individual responsibility for the first time was raised. Um, but it wasn't until we had the Rome Statute that created the International Criminal Court that we actually had a permanent court to hold individuals responses, responsible for breaches of crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression and so on. So the law in international law has made some advances. It's moved from the state to state responsibility, which, can, which of course continues to exist but rarely happens in practice, to the concept of individual responsibility with some disappointing outcomes because it's tended to be used only against black African states uh, and often against relatively minor criminals as distinct from the major rare instances of a president or a senior official. But what's been left out of this development and movement in international law over the last 60 or 70 years has been the corporation. The corporation has not had... It, it too is an abstract entity, in a sense, set up for reasons of, of, of managing a market. But it has not absorbed or accepted responsibility for breaches of human rights. And this is what uh, Professor John Ruggie, who uh, undertook a major piece of work on the uh, legal responsibility of transnational corporations for breaches of human rights, calls a governance gap. Um, well, well, in Australia, we have not only a governance gap in the sense that the corporations have not been responsible, uh, but we also have government policies that have been explicitly in breach of international law. The, the stop the boats policy, uh, offshore detention policies and the rejection of the cardinal principle of non refoulement at customary international law and under the Refugee Convention has been explicitly rejected in the language of the maritime powers legislation in Australia. Hardly understood by the Australian public at all. It was one of those many pieces of legislation that went through the parliamentary processes in the two weeks before last Christmas and early January of, of, uh, of this year. Um, so although the state under international law is legally responsible for the breaches of human rights, for practical purposes it's immune from legal process, it can act with impunity, and therefore it's become more important than ever that corporations accept some level of responsibility. Well, that's all very negative, and before I go into explain some more positive opportunities, perhaps we might explain or look at what is the business case for protecting human rights? Um, because... I have learned in this job that you have to be practical as well as putting the case for human rights because it's the right thing to do. We now find that some Australian businesses recognised human rights because they recognise it as good for business. And it's good for business because it's a way of avoiding litigation. 
And they're starting to understand at a more positive level that by uh, a more diverse employment policy, by inclusive workplace practices, uh, they are in fact having an advantage in a globalised and competitive environment. Companies are now making a name for being or presenting uh, policies which are more, um, uh, com com uh, more com in conformity with anti-discrimination and human rights law. Um, and one of those uh, instances that con uh, arises, one of the business case arguments arises in the context of age. Um, at the Human Rights Commission, we don't really have the resources or the skills to do some of the social science research. And we um, uh, uh, employ groups like Deloitte um, Access Economics um, or other of the major um, accounting companies or law firms. Uh, and sometimes they do the work pro bono, I might add. Um, and they will undertake the primary research to measure the economic impact, uh, in this case, of employment participation rates of people over 55 years of age. And the study that the Deloitte's completed for us uh, two years ago uh, is that an increase of 5% in the paid employment for Australians in the age group above 55 would add annually $48 billion to the national economy. It is huge, and it's no wonder, of course, that governments have got onto this finally. Um, I think, what was it, only as little as 15 years ago, uh, the government wanted us to retire. Uh, in my profession with a law firm, if you were 55, you were pretty much dead in the water. The senior manager was coming along to say, what are you going to do next? Um, but then we found uh, with, uh, with Mr Howard that he was understanding that in fact people over 55, not only do they bring huge riches to the, to the company in more abstract ways, uh, seniority, experience, wisdom, um, courteous and, and honourable business practices, uh, but they actually add to the bottom line. And uh, this is really borne out now by the Deloitte's um, work. Uh, and as you may know, um, Susan Ryan is working in this area at the request of the Attorney General uh, to see if we can get even better data to see if we can get some uh, more projects in place to encourage the employment of older people. Some of you be aware that as an employer it's possible to get a $10,000 payment if you take on a person over 55. It's been astonishing that there's been so little take up of this project. Um, mainly because of course I think that salaries are very high and uh, $10,000 is not going to do it for a small business person because it's still a big risk to, set, to take someone if they're not sure about the development of the economy. So it hasn't been very successful. Um, now, I did have a, a video um, on the power of oldness, and I wonder if I could show you this one. Thank you very much, no Kelly. No worries. This is just an example of the way we're trying to reach to a broader public through, our edu through education programs. I know what you're thinking. I'm old, very old. And you might be wondering, how did I get so lucky? Because, as you and I know, old people can do amazing things. We're experienced, and we know how things work. We help in our communities in ways big and small. We're active in life and online. We add billions to the economy. And when it comes to the tough choices, we've got the wisdom to get it right. Oldness, it's everywhere. And if you're lucky, it can happen to you. Sorry, sir. We're looking for someone younger. Yeah, so that, that's a rather sort of sobering... Uh, it starts off well and enthusiastically, but then you realise what is actually happening. Uh, to men and to women across Australia on a very, very regular basis. But it's exceptionally difficult to prove. Um, it's not so difficult in the pregnancy area. You can usually trace that back. Um, race, sometimes it stands out. 
but proving that somebody has been discriminated against on the grounds of their age is very, very difficult to show, or that they didn't get the promotion. Uh, that they're very, very difficult. Um, another area that we've done a lot of work on, uh, as you'd expect, is, is uh, on women. And again, the business case is extraordinary. Goldman Sachs in the United States has reported um, that uh, if the gaps between male and female employment and productivity be, could be closed, it would boost Australia's go gross domestic product by 11%. And the Grattan Institute has concluded that a 6% increase of women in the paid workforce in Australia will expand the economy by $25 billion a year. And exactly the same kinds of uh, outcomes of research uh, exist in relation to disability. Disability is probably one of the worst. Um, although there's huge public support for the disability insurance scheme and for uh, the working uh, to ensure that those with a disability are properly integrated into the community, it still remains um, a tiny percentage of the community with a disability with full paid employment. Um, and it's, and it's uh, a real struggle to get those numbers up. And we have been trying to talk to some of the big businesses to see if they can accept um, a target, at least, of 10%. But they, they are struggling to get to that 10%. Um, and I think that's where a lot more work needs to be done. Um, but similarly, um, the, the, the argument, the business case for diversity, is a very powerful one. And you find that where you have a diverse workforce, with different sexual orientations, race, um, cultural background, uh, disability and age, you find that you get improved staff loyalty, you retain high quality staff, you tend not to have um, labour disputes or shortages, you tend to enhance the business reputation and image, and you improve creativity and innovation. And we see this over and over again. Well, just a little a brief word about the, about the history, because I've mentioned the, the question of um, responsibility of corporations as an emerging issue over the last 20 years or so. Um, if we go right back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, um, there was no uh, mention of uh, corporations in that declaration, but there was a requirement that the human rights are to be respected by every individual and every organ of society. Um, now, I love to talk about this uh, declaration because you'll know that it was Doc Evatt, that rather brilliant, fasty lawyer who worked with Eleanor Roosevelt as one of eight countries asked to help draft the Universal Declaration. He was well aware that you needed to ensure responsibility for more than the individual, but responsibility for, for the various corporate and other organisations within that community. Um, since that time, Australia has worked very hard in the individual area for human rights, uh, but it's been extremely slow to get anything at the, uh, at the corporate level. There have been various attempts. Um, the old um, UN uh, uh, Commission on, on Transnational Corporations in 1974 tried to get up some uh, transnational corporate responsibility and failed. In the 90s, the United Nations Subcommission on the Promotion of Human Rights a working group um, attempted to get an international consensus on the responsibility of transnational corporations, and that again failed. Um, but with the turn of the century, the new millennium, the United Nations was successful in drawing together what is called the Global Compact. Some of you will have heard of this. Um, what they've decided to do is to work not on uh, formal legal binding rules, because they, every attempt that's been made thus far has failed at the international treaty level. So what they've decided to work on is voluntary codes of conduct. And this is what the, um, the Global Compact agrees to do. It has over 8,000 businesses across the world um, who are um, part of this voluntary body. Um, and it includes most of the major Australian companies, which I think is, is a helpful thing. But shortly after the Global Compact was established, um, uh, Professor John Ruggie was appointed by the United Nations as a special representative for business and human rights. And after ma many years of, of research and consultation, he developed the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. So they're not legally binding, but they are guiding principles, and they were adopted unanimously by the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2011. And basically, these... Uh, guiding principles require four 
strategies. One is that a company should adopt and implement a human rights policy throughout its operations and through its supply chains. One of the interesting features of, of this area is that it's actually easier to work with the big companies because they have huge reputational risks, because they've got big um, legal advice teams, uh, and they are well informed about the laws and the policies of the countries in which they operate. But where the biggest problems lie as a practical matter is right down the sl uh, supply chain with small to medium companies that typically do not know the vagaries of the law. Uh, they don't know about amendments to the Sex Discrimination Act or new rules in relation to funding for uh, employment of aged people. They haven't got the resources and they're, they're focused on making their businesses successful within the, within the short term. And that's where we really need to get our educative processes down and, and hence that, that video, uh, among others. So uh, it to it's for companies to establish a, a, a human rights policy that operates throughout the supply chain, to audit the human rights impact of their business operations. In other words, when every year you, or you have your financial audits, environmental audits, but you also need a human rights audit to say what's been the impact on your employees and on your customers or in the community in which you live. And that is something that you would assess and audit each year and you would then monitor it and thirdly, you would report on it so that it will be a transparent process of explaining to the community what the impact of your policies, business policies have been. Uh, so it's a, it's a self-monitoring system. And finally, fourthly, there will be a grievance mechanism uh, to allow the company to respond to those people who have questioned your business practices or have been harmed by it with some form of compensation or reparation uh, included in it. Now, as I say, these are not legally binding obligations, but it has been extremely interesting to see the very strong moral and ethical force that lies behind those guiding principles. And we're now getting companies um, in their annual reports reporting not only on environmental audits and financial <coughs> audits, but on their social impact and on their, the human rights impacts of their particular policies. And a very interesting example, if you wanted to look further, is the, the Unilever example. They're the first company, one of the world's biggest companies, but the first company ever to have a fully transparent reporting process <coughs> under these UN guiding principles. And it was launched in February this year. Um, it's a very interesting report by uh, Paul Polman, who's the CEO, um, and he talks about the greatest risks being discrimination, fair wages, forced labour, and, and emerging problems, slavery, freedom of association, sexual harassment and bullying, health and safety, land rights and working areas. And he looked at all of those areas in a very, very um, tra apparently transparent uh, reporting audit process for his company. But it, it did lead to some backlash. Um, some people said, well, they are causing harm to the community and they should be uh, uh, making compensation. Uh, and the company didn't emerge entirely unscathed from this process. Uh, but they were brave in doing it and it seems to be something that some other companies are now looking at, uh, at, at doing. Um, <coughs> And there are some, company, uh, some countries that are now embarking on legislation along very similar lines. The United States has passed the, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010, which requires all US listed companies to determine if any of their products are sourced from the, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo or any of its nine neighboring countries because they want to be absolutely certain about the, um, the labor conditions and the materials that are being sold partly to deal with the, uh, with the um, diamond trade. The United Kingdom, as you may know this year, passed the Modern Slavery Act. Who could believe it after Wilberforce uh, more than 250 years before? But we now have a Modern Slavery Act for this year, which requires corporations to disclose their actions that they've taken to ensure that there's no slavery within their supply chains. Now, Again, for the lawyers, you will know that uh, the traditional argument for a company has been to say, well, we only have a contractual relationship with these companies. We're not otherwise responsible for what they do in the supply chain. That will be the technical legal position. You're, you're, you simply have the terms of a contract and supply of business services or goods, 
uh, you comply with that contract and that's the end of the matter. You're certainly not responsible for the employment practices of a company further down the supply chain. But we know for a fact that that's where the problems are occurring and the big companies have got the capacity through their economic power to control the behaviour in the supply chains. So the UK government has now said you've got dis to disclose all actions you've done to make sure that the company itself has not engaged or in any way facilitated slavery, but they're responsible for the activities of the agents and companies that they work with, which is a huge leap forward uh, for transparency. Um, there have been some other developments and other efforts in the international legal environment to hold companies responsible as a matter of law. Um, and some of you may be aware of the alien tort uh, claim statute of 1789. 1789. It was passed in those rather heady days in the United States after the revolution, the creation of the new country, when the Americans said, we will be a place in which anybody <coughs> whose international human rights are, um, they didn't use the word human rights, they talked about international law, but wherever their rights at international law have been breached, you will be able to come to the courts of the United States for redress. A very noble idea in this legislation. Well, everybody forgot about it, of course. Absolutely <laughs> nothing happened until 1980. Uh, 200 years later, the, um, some Paraguayan uh, citizens brought an action in New York, in the District Court of New York, because a Paraguayan senior police officer had stumbled into the, uh, d uh, the jurisdiction of the District Court of New York, uh, who had been allegedly responsible for torture against citizens in Paraguay. Now, normally, international law would say nothing to do with the United States at all. These, this is a, an act of torture and execution that took place uh, outside the law by police officers and senior police officers, presumably under the control of government. Uh, it's a matter for Paraguayan law, but not a matter for the United States. But that's not what the United States court said. Ultimately, in the Supreme Court, it said, yes, the alien torts legislation does apply. Uh, and uh, damages were awarded against the Paraguayan police officials and the government. Well, those damages, of course, were never paid, uh, but the point was well made in 1980 that we will find a time that governments will start to pass laws which have an extraterritorial effect and we will prosecute for breaches whenever that person comes within their territory. Now, this has long happened in antitrust law. I mean, it's rather tragic that we're prepared to apply laws extraterritorially on restrictive trade practices and monopolies, but we're not prepared to do it in relation to human rights breaches. But you will also remember the, the, uh, the bravery and the courage of that Spanish magistrate who issued a writ for the arrest of um, Pinochet from, uh, from Chile. And that set off a chain of cases uh, through the British House of Lords, ultimately, as it then was, uh, to say that the doctrine of sovereign immunity from the jurisdiction for heads of states no longer applies to crimes as egregious as torture. <coughs> so these are small um, steps forward by courts that are traditionally very reluctant to assert an extraterritorial jurisdiction over the acts of corporations or of individuals and politicians. But slowly it is starting to happen as an idea. And once that idea takes seed, you start to find the courts will slowly move towards asserting jurisdiction. Now, in fact, the alien torts legislation has been disappointing. Uh, many uh, people have tried to use it for egregious breaches of human rights, and I think our Australian human rights defender Jeffrey Robertson tried to bring the Pope before the uh, United States courts uh, for the role of the Vatican during the Second World War. Well, I think you'd have to say that was a, that was a, 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 a bridge too far for the uh, United States courts. But you can see the direction. You can see once the idea is there that courts uh, will, like Belgium, will start to assert jurisdiction extraterritorially and they will do it over increasingly the companies. We've seen greater advances in environmental law than we have in human rights law, but I think we will start to see some changes. We saw a recent case, um, Keobel against Royal Dutch Petroleum, just a couple of years ago. That came to the United States court under the Alien Torts legislation, and it concerned the execution um, uh, by the Nigerian government 
uh, of a number of um, political protesters. And the argument was that the Shell, Dutch Shell Oil Company had connived at, facilitated these executions uh, with the Nigerian government. Now, I have no idea whether the facts bore out those allegations, but again, you can see that uh, there are attempts to bring corporations to account for their actions within the jurisdictions in which they operate. Well, um, I, I, I must um, uh, bring this to an end, but I did want to uh, come to what all this means for Australia, um, these developments, these snippets of ideas and developments, the rugged guiding principles, the global compact, some national legislation, and the developments of some international principles about corporate responsibility. One of the great difficulties for Australia is that we are truly exceptionalist in our approach to human rights. Our constitution has very few protections for human rights. We have a right to freedom of religion, intended not really to protect freedom of religion, to, but to pr protect against an established church, but nonetheless, the right to freedom of religion, the right to vote, the right to be compensated if our property is taken from us, and the High Court has implied a right of political communication, but no right to freedom of expression. We're the only common law country in the entire world that does not have a Bill of Rights, either in the Constitution or in legislative form. So we have no benchmark against which our courts can consider these matters um, uh, without legislation. Now, I've re mentioned Doc Evatt. From the years of Doc Evatt, we've been good international citizens. We've We've been, uh, played a very strong role, it should be said, until uh, and including the creation of the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. We've been in there drafting, negotiating and promoting the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on the Rights of the Child, International Covenant on Economic and Social Rights, Refugees Convention and so on. All of these, we've played a very strong role in negotiating. But the extraordinary phenomenon for Australia has been that in the main, we have not given them domestic implementation in domestic law. And you'll understand that because of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, our diplomats can't go off and negotiate the Convention on the Rights of the Child and make that binding in Australian law. Parliament has to give it effect in domestic law. But the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is not part of Australian law, nor is the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The parts of the Refugee Convention were implemented in the Migration Act, but this government has stripped them out of the Migration Act in the last few months. So the definition, for example, of a refugee is now a matter for a government official and ultimately the discretion of the minister, but not a matter for international law. Um, so we have this very odd phenomenon that we've, we've been out there re uh, negotiating and ratifying the treaties, but we've not given them effect in domestic law. We've given effect to some. The Race Discri Discrimination Act, although we suspended it for the Northern Territory intervention, Sex Discrimination Act and the Convention, <laughs> Disability Convention, and our legislation, although some of you may know uh, that in fact we negotiated the Disability Discrimination Act before the International Convention came into effect. We were a leader and we could very well be a leader in relation to age discrimination because there's no International Convention on Age Discrimination, but Australia's led in that legislation. So we've done some things quite well and those are the acts for which we have very specific responsibility at the Human Rights Commission as well as responsibility for the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Convention on the Rights of the Child and one or two other areas of law. But I think you're starting to see what the difficulty is for, for me and, uh, as President and for the Commission as a whole. Because many of the international human rights standards that it's my job to call into question if they're breached are not part of Australian law. So when I go to the Minister for Immigration and I say, at the moment, you're holding 300 children in detention, and you've held some of them for years, and that is in gross breach of the prohibition on arbitrary detention without charge or trial of the International <laughs> Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then if I'm courageous enough to say it's also in breach of the Magna Carta, but we won't, that's, that's a little too, far, too much for the minister. But if I were to say... <laughs> This is in breach of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. You cannot hold these children and their families for years in these conditions. It is in breach of fundamental principles of international law. The Minister can quite uh, correctly say to me, that convention is not part of Australian law. It's your job to talk about it. That's fine. But I don't have to abide by it. And if I were to say, well, I'll go to the court, I'll go to the High Court, and I will appeal to the court to release these people 
What will the court do? Well, the High Court, up to now, um, from a decision in 2007, notoriously, in a four to three decision, said mandatory indefinite detention without charge or trial is valid under the Australian Constitution. And that is, that is I think, the, the clearest way in the Alcatel decision of explaining the parlous position in which we have found ourselves in Australia. And not only are we exceptionalist as a nation within our own laws, but we live in an exceptional pocket of the world. Because every region of the world, Africa, Latin America, North America, Britain, the United Kingdom, much of the Middle East, they now have, the Arabs now have their own regional court, even New Zealand, they all have uh, adherence to human rights, uh, um, bills of rights, charters, and regional commissions and courts. But in the area of the world we live in, there is no agreed understanding on the rule of law uh, or of, of we have no regional charter of human rights, we have no commission or court of human rights, so we have no capacity to get a regional um, jurisprudence or regional thinking about these fundamental principles. Now that's a phenomenon of Australia living in this part of the world and I think the very exciting challenge is for us to work more cooperatively with these countries in our own region. And I think, for example, the, 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 the tragedy of the death of the two Australians in, in Indonesia may be a spark that could get the region to talk about a moratorium on the death penalty, which is where they've in fact been moving quite slowly. But they do work differently and we've got to learn to work in that environment. But I, I wanted really to show this exceptionalism of our region and exceptionalism of Australia and how exceptionally difficult it is for us to make our arguments in a court uh, that will not apply an international treaty that's not part of Australian law. And nor should a court do that. Nobody in principle would want that to happen. But where you have a parliament that will, will not implement these treaties in domestic law and where both sides of politics um, work together to agree upon uh, terms of domestic legislation which is in explicit breach of our international obligations, then it's extremely difficult to know where you go to. Because, we, because the, the parliament isn't supporting it, executive always wants an executive overreach, or what Cory Bernardi describes as power creep. I don't usually quote the Cory Bernardi, but I think, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in this instance he's right. But this is, a, this is a phenomenon for Australia of the last 15 years, and I think it's something we need to be really conscious of. Well, uh, what does it mean for us? So we're in a difficult situation, uh, but... We have got some changes, and a very interesting one that perhaps lawyers are going to be mainly interested in, and that is that you know there's been a movement to get a national legal profession going, and it hasn't succeeded, but New South Wales and Victoria have joined together, and we now have, uh, the passed just a couple of months ago, the new professional conduct and practice rules for all lawyers working in those two major states in Australia. And there is a new rule that all lawyers must, in the course of their practice, uh, not engage in conduct that constitutes discrimination, sexual has harassment and workplace bullying. And to my complete surprise, the definition of these things are the definitions used by the Australian Human Rights Commission. Now, they didn't consult us about this. Um, and uh, the notion of human rights is that which we adopt, which I'm delighted by. Uh, but it, what it does mean is that the profession will now explicitly need to refer to core human rights standards. And again, they're, they're, they're internally managed by the profession, but it lifts the standard in terms of, of ethics and values, which I know is what uh, this research institute is primarily concerned about. Now, for the future, um, we have the um, Sustainable Development Book Goals just developed by the United Nations. I think that will continue this move towards um, finding uh, responsibility of corporations and businesses, but it will probably work for the most part, on voluntary standards until national governments pass legislation which exercises some form of extraterritorial jurisdiction, particularly over the companies that are registered in Australia. Uh, their activities are, are offshore should be subject and, and sometimes are subject to domestic law, uh, but we need sometimes also to look at the extraterritorial uh, application of our laws in a more profound way so that we can ensure that companies are respecting and understanding the impact of their work uh, on uh, social, social matters. So uh, in conclusion, uh, and thank you for listening to me for so long, 
I think the, there is a momentum for uh, understanding and working together with business to achieve human rights outcomes. Um, the, the, uh, the strong arm of the law, litigation, is not the best way to go, but it is a very, very powerful tool to change thinking. Um, but perhaps I can conclude by saying that I do know uh, from my own experience that ultimately laws mean very little if you don't have a community acceptance of the importance of the norms and ethics that underlie the law that, that we're responsible for at the Human Rights Commission. So I wish the research continued success with its, uh, the centre with its research in this area because I think that this is... Uh, this question of business and human rights is one of the important issues for these for the coming decade. Thank you very much indeed. Great talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. You. Two things. One, do you think you're going to be getting a better hearing in Canberra now that Malcolm has turfed Tony out of the top job? And secondly, what do you think the implication on human rights is of the international or the interstate dispute settlement mechanisms that are embedded in the free trade agreements that Australia has negotiated and is negotiating? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'd really rather not comment on those um, the bilateral settlement processes for the free trade agreement because I haven't seen the detail. I really don't know how they're operating. Um, but I do know that this government is very reluctant to uh, engage in, uh, in uh, international commercial arbitration in a jurisdiction other than Australia, um, which is a, a problem for the business community. And it's one of the big issues that they are they're currently debating. So we'll have to see how that emerges. But the political pressure, of course, to, to pass the, uh, the free trade agreement is very strong now, and I think, uh, I think that's very likely to happen um, with the pressure on, on the Labor government and Mr Shorten. Uh, as for the, the change in leadership, uh, look, I, I think collectively across Australia we've just breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 It's, it's a harsh thing to say, and nobody wishes harm, but I, I, I basically don't know. <laughs> But I, I, think that, I think the answer to your question is we, we think that with a more um, moderate and reasoned leadership, we will have more moderate and reasoned policies and implementation of those policies. Um, Mr Turnbull is, has supported the human right in the worst of the days, uh, Mr. Turnbull was the one of the uh, was the only minister to come out in support of the commission, and he did so very strongly. So I think that really gives the objective a uh, proper answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. It was uh, for your speech. It was uh, encouraging and um, very interesting. You mentioned how the the Australian government has uh, never challenged the Human Rights Commission. However, it's evident that it is quite free to ignore it. Um, I wonder if the implementation of either a Bill of Rights or a change to the Australian Constitution would make that a good deal more difficult. Uh, so what was the first part of the question? I just quite, didn't quite get it. Oh, I was wondering whether or not um, either a, a change to the Australian Constitution or an introduction of a Bill of Rights would, it ma would make it more difficult for the Australian government to ignore the Human Rights Commission. Oh, um, look, if we had a, a, let's say we had a legislated Bill of Rights along the lines that exists quite well in Victoria, not perfect, but it's working quite well. If we had that at the national level, it would mean that the Human Rights Commission would be less important <laughs> because you would go straight to the courts and you would say, these are my rights, and you go, if, if they're not abided by, you simply get to the High Court as quickly as you can. Um, and the High Court will make a decision. Um, there'd always be a role for the Human Rights Commission to deal with complaints at the, the level we deal with them at, because they're confidential and they're conciliatory. Um, but 
if, if we had a Bill of Rights, it would transform the situation in Australia. And it would mean, of course, that the governments could not act inconsistently with it. But if it didn't work for Australia, if we, if we found that as a nation it, it really wasn't where we want to go, then you, you repeal the legislation. It's not difficult to do it by legislation. If you do it as a... We, we, we'll never get a constitutional amendment to, uh, for a Bill of Rights. I don't think in any kind of remotely foreseeable future will we, will we get that. With leadership we could get it, but we don't seem to have that leadership. But if we had a legislated one, uh, then it's a, it's a sort of suck it and see kind of thing. It's gone well in Victoria and in the ACT. Uh, New Zealand's had one for about uh, 15 years um, and they've gone from strength to strength. I think it's something we could experiment with. Thank you. Um, it's, there's been a bit of discussion in the media about the um, quite... Um, outstanding humanitarian response by the German Chancellor Angela yes. Merkel to the Syrian refugee mm -hmm. crisis. And my question is, um, what do you think if we had greater proportion of female representation on the likes of company boards mm -hmm. that the human rights issue would come more to the forefront and we could, as you explained, work from the front, not the back? Yes, yes. Look, I'd very much like to think that would, would be the case. Uh, unfortunately, it isn't always the case. I mean, some female leaders have not had any interest in human rights at all. Um, and I won't mention <laughs> I'm sure you know who I mean. But Angela Merkel is remarkable. But if, if you look at her background, she comes from East Germany. Um, she's got a strong, always had a strong background in, in human rights and understands the, the, the power and the force of law and government. I was very interested, she gave, when she came out for the G20, she gave a, a speech in Sydney. And I went to that speech and I was fascinated by the fact that the first 15 minutes of her speech were about the human rights responsibilities of governments and corporations. So she deeply believes in what she... This isn't a, a, a sort of sentimental flash in the pan, that this is something she deeply believes in. But, but I think you need that courageous leadership, because she's clearly turning off some of her own people. But, but I think, in Australia, translating that to Australia, uh, it, it's not a gender thing, I don't think. I, I think it's that we've had poor quality leaders who will not stand up for what ordinary Australians on the street know is the right thing to do. I'm certain that if our political leaders said to us, um, Fran Kelly, on, on a Monday morning, we've thought deeply about this and we've taken the wrong road. We're going to work with our neighbours over a proper settlement policy. We're going to open our arms in an orderly way to refugees so they're not drowning at sea, uh, but, but we, we, we intercept their boats, we take them to an appropriate place, we assess them rapidly, uh, and we ensure a pathway to settlement, and we share it in a respectful way with our neighbours. That will mean Australia probably takes more than we've ever taken because our neighbours take far more than we do. Uh, but, but that is an orderly, rule-of-law-based way of doing it. Uh, and I think the Australian public would come behind a leader who was prepared to stand up and do that. Now, uh, what, what about women? I, I, I mean, we, we clearly must have more women on, on, in senior positions on boards. Uh, because their leadership, they, it, it, to, to, to achieve change, you have to have a measure of power. And to have power, you've got to be in the political environment where, where they've been absent for the last two years, almost, apart from one outstanding woman. Um, we need, clearly need more leaders. Uh, we need them across government, across, across the business community. I think women are a little more inclined to say in a, to, in a director's meeting, well, you know, are you think, have you thought about what the impact is in the community? Uh, uh, is this the right or ethical thing to do because it will have an impact on the company? And anyway, do we want to be working for a company that's not acting in an appropriate ethical way, even if it might be technically legally right? I think women probably are inclined to raise that a little more. Um, but one of the things you may know we've been doing at the Commission um, is, is develop this concept of male champions of change. Well, as a 60s feminist, the idea of relying on men to do this for you filled me with horror. <laughs> I didn't think this was a very good idea. But it's proved to be a valuable idea because it's a partnership with men who get it. And when men get it, and they're powerful men, then you can really achieve change. So there are very many ways of achieving this. I'd love to see more women in senior positions um, willing to take on public life, which is not easy, um, and, uh, and, and starting to speak up for things that... As I say, ordinary Australians know are the right things to do, and they're consistent with the whole history of Australia. 
this man Hello. in the front has been asking. Yes. <laughs> Hello, uh, P Professor uh, Chicks. Thank you very much for, uh, for oh, the talk. Sorry, sorry oh. could we uh, just, I'm in the front and then your question. Sorry. Well, I humbly thank you. Um, yeah, just a, just a question. Um, Malcolm Turnbull made comment recently, well, a couple of months ago that he was open to the idea of repealing Section 18C of the mm. Racial Discrimination Act of 1975. Now, we all know that, I don't think he's the Messiah, that we all think he is. I mean, he's, he's got some great ideas mm. of climate change and mm. same-sex marriage, mm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. But he's also an individual who believes in privatization and the deregulation mm. of probably corporate identities mm. and corporate groups. Now, my concern is, is twofold, and they're interrelated. Section 18C is very similar to Section 28A of the Sexual Discrimination Act of 1984. And the two shields that they utilize to protect individuals uh, of humiliate and yeah. offend. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, what I find perplexing, that during the debate for Section 18C, there's no, there wasn't much talk about protecting Section 28A, because you would think that if you get rid of that and say that's freedom of speech, to say whatever you want in the workplace, that's racist. What's stopping someone from saying, well, it's freedom of speech to say whatever you want in the workplace if it's sexist? I That's mean, right. it's That's very right. perplexing that that argument has been made. Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned with whether or not, if that were to, to transpire, what powers do you have to actually debate Well, um, as you may know, the, the commission policy, and it was carried through by Dr. Tim Sook Parmesan um, as the race discrimination commissioner, we fought very, very hard against... Um, amendment of 18C. Uh, it was driven by the political agenda in relation to the Bolt case, of course. Um, and uh, the, uh, the Bolt case was never appealed. They had deep pockets, they could easily have appealed it, and they knew they'd lose if they did. Um, but to come back to the substantive question, um, 18C says that it is, um, it's a civil offence, it's not a criminal offence, but a civil offence um, to offend, humiliate, intimidate, um, and uh, I've forgotten the third, to um, offend, insult, humiliate, and intimidate, the four. And if you do it in public because of race, then you've committed a civil offence. But what's not mentioned is that 18C is followed by 18D, and 18D says, if you made that comment as fair comment, as, a, as an artist, as a journalist, uh, you've got, you've done your, uh, um, your research, you were reasonably accurate about what you were saying, and it was done in good faith, then even if it did offend, insult, humiliate, and intimidate, you would be, ha you would have a defence. So it was the free speech defence. Now, Bolt, of course, failed on the free speech defence because he got his facts wrong, and the judge decided he was not acting in good faith. Now, I, lo I, I need to say that in public because there seems to be some sense that somehow the judge was deeply unfair to Bolt. But, but Bolt could have appealed those findings. And judges don't often make findings of lack of good faith uh, in journalists. It's really quite unusual. But he failed that test. Rightly or wrongly, he failed and he didn't appeal. <coughs> but it, what it led to this was this political attempt to change the legislation. And initially, I'd have to admit that I thought, well, the words offending and insulting are fairly low-level words. And maybe you could take those words out of 18C and heighten it by talking about vilification and hatred. Um, and, and I thought maybe that was a compromise, and, and we tried to talk to the attorney about a compromise. Um, but, but it was quite clear that they really wanted to get rid of the whole section or to, in the explanatory um, uh, exposure draft, to develop something which was far different and would, would really never have, have touched the problem. Um, but what we did was to, we look at, looked at what the courts have done. The courts have always applied a very high standard. So merely insulting and intimidating was never going to uh, get you across the threshold. It had to be deeply and profoundly insulting. Um, and there have only been, I think, about eight or nine cases ever uh, and on this issue. And only three or four have ever been successful. Um, the Chief Justice Robert French looked at one, the, the Brofo case, which was a cartoon um, denigratory of um, uh, Aborigines in Western Australia. And uh, the Chief, uh, the, he wasn't Chief Justice then, he was with the Federal Court. He, he said, look, this, was, this cartoon was denigratory and insulting um, and intimidating to the Indigenous community, but it was done in good faith, it was an artistic expression of an idea, uh, and it's, part, it's protected by freedom of political communication. So most of the cases failed. But Bolt, of course, was one that 
um, succeeded. And, uh, and that drove the political process. Um, for the future, well, we don't know what Mr Turnbull's going to do on these things. I think one of the th abiding lessons that everybody should learn from that exercise was that the Australian community came together. Every uh, aspect, Ch Chinese, Vietnamese, um, uh, Muslim communities, the, the, or the religious faiths, all the multicultural groups, multicultural Australia, they all came together and said 18C must be preserved. And in the end, as you know, uh, Mr Abbott uh, decided not to go forward with that proposal and decided to go instead, uh, having been a supporter of free speech in relation to 18C amendments or proposed amendments, he then proceeded to embark on a whole lot of legislation to make advocacy of terrorism and offence and various other forms of free speech are now an offence. So I don't think that the sincerity of their commitment to the principle of free speech um, is, is uh, really well made in, in their case. So uh, let's wait and see. We really have, have to wait and see what policies... But it w wouldn't it be extremely foolish to go forward with an attempt to... another attempt to, to amend 18C? I think they've lost that battle. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tricks. Uh, okay, first I want to make an announcement. Uh, currently we are running refugee talks in Parramatta and King's Cross. We have refugees themselves come to here to, to share their story, why they came here by boat, mainly, and then hopefully uh, by seeing them and then the people can change people's hearts and then change their minds and then later, later on we can change policy. Okay, I've just passed pass around and the, the flyers. Yeah, so, he, he, so if you guys haven't got one, then please, please take one and then, then go. And then my question is, okay, now we know the government, and uh, they, they keep, uh, they, they keep, keep, keep uh, violating uh, all those regulations and, and the laws in terms of international like, uh, tra uh, treaty and yeah, yeah, all those. And then, and then, okay, so on the other hand, uh, we want to put a, 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 a pressure on those uh, big business, uh, those uh, uh, co international corporations. But, but if, if we do want to, if all those pressure need to be be useful, then we need to uh, have uh, have the government to really uh, in, uh, in, implement or in, enforce those laws. But now the government themselves they are violating the laws, and then also no, no nobody really really in, 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 uh, implement the law. For example, like uh, all, all, all the things uh, tran uh, transfer they have done on Menace Island and Nauru, they, they are all vi violate all the regulation. Then the government they, they just do not do it. They just say they have put the okay. They just say that that's part of the PNG. The na, na, na root, that's their right. responsibility. So I want to know. So what's your view? So you think uh, how uh, okay how far okay how, how much we can get uh, through the corporate corporate social okay corporate social responsibility type of campaign and then yeah. from the the, the yeah, bo, 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 from BDS the the the, the, the boycott yeah, divestment and uh, san yes, sanction. Indeed. You are mm -hmm. familiar with this. So yeah. I'm wondering. So how far we can go? Okay. 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 Well, look. Uh, I mean, of course, you're you're right. This is very frustrating. We've got in on this issue. Uh, we've got the government and the major corporations um, in breach, clearly in breach of international law. So what, what do we do? Well, the public will vote uh, eventually. I mean, that's always the democratic solution. But I, I'd like to remind you all that um, in the midst of all of this, Australia has declared its candidacy for the first time to become a member of the United Nations Human Rights Council. <laughs> and... Australia is up for its second universal periodic review in Geneva in November. Um, and that is, um, um, under the, universe, uh, the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council, that is a peer-to-peer -peer review by states of, of other states. And it's been quite successful. Um, you m might remember the bad old days of the Human Rights Commission. It was much criticised, etc. But this Human Rights Council has been re restructured and it's actually doing quite a good job. And, it, and we've, we've been through one review process. We had about 100, um, or maybe 200, a, a huge number of recommendations made against Australia. Ex Australia accepted 90% of them. Four years later, they've implemented only 11% of them. So we're going now for the second round, and there is, a, I can say, a very significant international interest in Australia's refugee policy and indigenous policy, particularly after the Northern Territory intervention, but also violence against women. So I think that we, in the context of making our formal application before the UN to become a UN um, Human Rights Council member, uh, we're also facing public criticism in the, um, in, the, in the United Nations Human Rights Council itself. Now, as you know, our former Prime Minister said to uh, Mendes, who was the Special Rapporteur in Torture, who said that Australia was in breach of the Torture Convention, our former Prime Minister said, 
uh, we don't want to be lectured to at by the United Nations. Now, I think that that approach will change and we will be more respectful of the United Nations, particularly, interestingly enough, in light of the fact that our foreign minister was able to take advantage of being in the Security Council and President of the Security Council at the time of the downing of the, <coughs> of the plane in, in Ukraine. So we, uh, we understand at her level, as minister, uh, at Julie Bishop's level, the importance of engagement in these international organisations. We are isolated. That's part of our exceptionalism. And if we're part of these... The UN Council, when, um, uh, Security Council, when we can get elected, the Human Rights Council, when we can get on, or any of the other bodies, we are more integrated into the international community and more inclined to, uh, to work collaboratively with our neighbours and with the international community. And that's the way forward, I think. And I think we've got a ray of light now. And we're now, as the gentleman in the front has said, we've just got to wait and see how these policies actually evolve in the future. Thank you.